They're not easy to build. It is leather, yeah. Okay. Let's check what the next one is. They used to paddle these. The Russians set up a, a fort in California, Fort Ross, north of San Francisco, and the Lutic people went down there in their kayaks from Kodiak and Prince William Sound. They paddled all the way. They, uh, talk about distance. They were cruisers. They were cruisers. Amazing. Yeah, I was born in Ketchikan, Alaska. Yeah, my mother was born in Ketchikan, Alaska, and uh, she grew up there in Ketchikan. And as I said, I grew up in other parts of Alaska. Uh, she was a very, very educated woman, and she, she was very familiar with the Tlingit culture, the Northwest Coast, and she taught me quite a lot about that. From 1944 to 48, I lived in Chiniga Village, which is on the western side of Prince William Sound. My father was a school teacher there. And uh, at that time, it was the only village that was building the Bidarkas. The outboard motors and the plywood boats had pretty much displaced them even then. But this one village was still building them because of their master craftsman, who was Steve Britzkloff. At the time that I was living there, there was about seven Bidarkas. Seven men owned them. My father owned one, and I paddled it. Um, I also watched them repairing Bidarkas. Steve Ritzkloff passed away in 1944, just about a couple months before we came to the village. And so the master building kind of came to a halt, but the maintenance was still going on. I don't know what the monetary transaction was. I know my father paid $75 for his Vidarka. Did your father want it just for recreational use? He did, but the men in the village were using it for hunting. And um, by the way, these were paddled kneeling, not sitting. And that meant that you had a lot of room that otherwise you wouldn't have, because you can imagine people uh, kneeling here. So all this space in between was available for carrying things. And um, these were big load haulers. These Bidarkas were 21 feet long or more. You would have an entire family in the Bidarka, and they would use them for traveling and hunting. And they would go in the summer to their fish camps, which were over on the mainland, um, the Kenai Peninsula. Yeah. And um, the kids would lie down in the middle down here. So you'd have three adults in here, and you'd have two or three kids inside lying down. My friends uh, who did this, um, their little kids, said that, you know, they're so stiff and cold and tired by the time they got to the fish camp, a 10-hour paddle, you know, that they'd have to be pulled out and carried up to the camp. <laughs> they could hardly move. <laughs> but uh, also with the matter of holding it until you got there, <laughs> oh boy, these, these kids, oh, come on, oh, when are we going to continue? You just hold it, boy. <laughs> you got hours to go. <laughs> a little claustrophobic down there, too, I'll bet. Oh, they loved it down there because uh, the sealskin covering was translucent. You could see through it. And uh, the water going by was very soothing. And as a matter of fact, my friends who were, who were little kids then said that they usually just slept and it was really quite comfortable. Uh -huh. It was kind of neat. Normally they hunted seal and their weapon of choice was a 22, uh, center fire, long range cartridge, so high velocity. And that was quite enough to kill a seal. That's where kneeling comes into play. You can't hunt sitting down. You have to kneel to hunt. And that's one of the reasons why they kneeled. The other was because they had room in here. And the other was that when you're kneeling, you have more height above, and you can maneuver the kayak just by shifting their weight. So there are a lot of reasons for kneeling. And they could kneel a long time. I mentioned this 10-hour 10, 10 trip. They, they would kneel for 10 hours at a time. When they maintained these, you said that the master builder would build a few, but that was transitioning out by the time that you were around. But he would be doing considerable maintenance. What sort they of maintenance? Lot of maintenance. Yeah. What sort of maintenance would you do? Would you oil the skin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, there's there can be breakage. The ribs can break. Um, the skin ha is a high maintenance item. It's actually sea lion skin, and it's fem female sea lion skin, by the way, for a couple of reasons. More flexible and no holes. So the Male sea lions tend to bite each other and leave a hole. The skin is leather, basically, and leather, as it gets older, shrinks and dries out. And there's two bad things that happen. One is it cracks, 
which is going to sink you. And the other is that it contracts and it can crush this frame. And I've seen some museum ones where the ribs are crushed upward right at the keelson, just like this. So you don't want it to stay on for more than a year. You want to take the skin off every year. The way they put the skin on is they sew it at the front and they sew it up the back. And then they have lashings, lacings actually going back and forth here to pull the top together. And then they put a temporary seam on top. But then when they um, take it off, they undo the lacings and the temporary seam and they pull it off like a sock just this way. And uh, then they soak it and they re-oil it and they oil it with seal oil. So it's a lot of maintenance. Did they roll these things? Oh, that's a good story. Yes, they did roll them. And uh, you know, for the life of me, I don't know how, I imagine they roll them when they're single. But I understand you can roll them with two people in them. And there's an interesting story about this because you know, you're launching in surf a lot of times, and that's tough. You point out straight and you hit the surf, and uh, it's hard to get through surf. It's really hard to punch through. But they would roll through the surf. You know, they come through and the waves come and they roll like this, and they corkscrew through like that. What, what was that for? To, to punch through waves? Or? Yeah, right. So you're, you're using it as though it was a, a screw going uh -huh. through. Uh huh. Yeah, so cool. Because you don't want it to lift over a breaking sea. Yeah, because it'll knock you backward, uh -huh. and then it'll knock you over. Huh. Yeah, so really quite amazing. My college years, I learned molecular structure. I got a doctorate in chemistry. I spent my time working out the structure of molecules, and believe me, there's a relationship between that and this, because look at this structure. It's a beautiful structure. It evolved for a purpose. And so How did, long do you suppose it took to evolve like that? I think it was a 10,000 year period, frankly. Okay, um, and, and again, I saw this same sort of beauty in the work I was doing in seeing these molecular structures. Structure and energy are closely related. The structure channels the energy, makes it work and makes it work the best possible way so that whatever you're doing, you're using your energy to the max. It's the most efficient way. And that's true whether the structure is your bone structure or whether it's the kayak structure or when I was doing the research molecular structure. Molecular structure is all about using energy. That molecule is there to use the energy around it and pass it so that it will do something and do it the most efficiently. And so that's what this is doing. Yes, structure is everything. There were, I guess, pretty good accounts from sea captains when they first encountered Badarkas that they were going very fast. They are very fast. Mm -hmm. Well, they were talking about 8 to 10 knots. Yeah, sure. Can, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, that's always been the mystery surrounding Badarkas. Well, if you saw the way that the Lutic men are built, you would understand how they could do it. They had shoulders like this, waists like this, and chests just massive. I mean, they're really strong in the upper body, mm -hmm. and they could paddle hard. And yes, uh, and there's stories about uh, paddling by Darkos from Chiniga to Cordova in, in a, a day and a half. I mean, incredible speed because they were so strong. And again, the kayak was very efficient, and so it take, took the least possible effort to go. So between the way that these men were physically built and the way that the kayak was built, yes. These kayaks flexed a lot. This had a lot to do with the energy management in a bidarka. The bidarka is all about using the energy that's there in your environment. And you're not fighting your waves you are letting the waves do your work for you. This is a very important thing. And this took, I think, 10,000 years to evolve this. But the original builders were very, very smart, and they were very technical. This is high tech. I mean, this is not just a, a, an accident. <laughs> uh, this, this was made to keep you alive. This boat actually was felt to be alive and it also felt that you had to have the relationship to it 
that a good relationship to it, and it would take care of you. It's all about this flex, about using the energy. Um, and so when you hit a wave, there's two things that happen. <laughs> you have this slot here. You also have this high point here, and you have these bow plates here, which are deflector plates. So the wave does not go off like this and along. It goes like this, like this. and it's lifting your kayak. And you go up the wave like this, and your speed does not drop. In an irregular kayak, you punch the wave and you stop. And then you may even slide backward, and then you go sidewise. But uh, this one, you go up the wave naturally, and at the top of the wave, you ride down the back. So you're using the energy in that wave to push you. Um, using this deflector, using this slot, and using the way it rides along here, and the way the Bidarka flexes as you go, is pushing itself along. The bow is pretty unique, and if you look at this bow, you will see that actually, if you hold it this way, you see here's the trunk of the tree going down, and this is a root curving. And you could either salvage a stump on the beach. Find which, a which crook. It's a crook, but it's actually not a crook so much as it's the actual root. So they would salvage it on the beach, or they would go cut a tree, and you cut your tree about this high above. And then you go down through and get the root. And then when you carve, you have that root going out here. And that makes a really nice carving because you've got your grain running in the curve instead of trying to hack across the grain. It also lends uh, some of the spirit to the kayak. And I do feel there's a spirit in these kayaks. What's the thought about the back fin? Oh, the back here? Yeah. Oh, that's very good. Okay. You'll notice that it's plumb, straight up. And that's on purpose, because you want this Bidarka to track. That is, you want it to be able to go in a straight line. Now, you also want it to turn, too, but you really want that straight line. They had tough conditions up there, heavy, heavy weather. So this plumb stern, as long as it's got this much down in the water, you can track all day. You can go crosswise of the wind. You can go anywhere you want. And you can turn as well, as long as that is down in the water. And you don't need a rudder. You know, the commercial kayaks, they curve up like this. They don't get it. And they wonder why they can't stay straight in the wind. They tend to weathercock a lot. They sure do. Or if they're sidewise, they just want to, yeah, weathercock. Yeah. So again, they knew what they are doing when they made this plum stern. This was the little village of Shinige. It was perhaps hardest hit of all by the monstrous waves. In fact, it is difficult to believe that there ever was a village here on this bare ground. Every building, with the exception of the schoolhouse on the hill, was destroyed. Over half of the people who lived here were killed. The sudden horror that came without warning struck with such force and stealth that even the quick four-footed citizens of Shinige, with their alert senses far superior to those of man, could not escape. And then, all over Alaska, as suddenly as it had come, it was gone. Back to 44, 48, the big influence in all this was Steve Lassoff. Steve Lassoff was a Lutic native. He was a priest there, basically. He baptized me, and also my brother, and I became part of the village. And he was really an amazing man. He spoke Russian, he spoke Lutic, and he spoke English. He actually spoke another language, Ukrainian. He was uh, really a, the most important man in the village in many ways. His Bidarka is the one that I am building because a tsunami earthquake struck Chiniga in 1964 and it wiped out the village. Now, the schoolhouse was built up on a hill and that's where we lived, was up in the schoolhouse. The survivors of this were the ones who got up the hill and stayed in the, in the, in the schoolhouse. Uh, Steve had a beautiful Bidarka, skin-covered, and he made a long paddle in, when he was 70 years old from Chiniga over to Cordova. It took him several weeks, but that was the last time he paddled. After that, he gave his Bidarka to a young man who lived in Cordova. And this is very unusual. You don't give away your Bidarka, but he did. And that was about 1952 or so. 
And so this fellow took it to Cordova and paddled it there and kept it there. And eventually, as time went on, it was put in the museum there, about 1967 or so, 69, somewhere in there. So that Bidarka is the one that I documented to build my own. Mm -hmm. And so my Bidarkas are replicas of Steve's. I went on to a long teaching career, about 30 years, <laughs> teaching in the community colleges in Seattle. I retired in 1998. So then I had some time on my hands, and um, I remembered these Bidarkas, and I thought, you know, I'd like to build these. And Corey Friedman up in Anacortes was building Bidarkas, but not this kind. He was building the Aleutian style. So I went to see him, and um, I said I wanted to build the Prince William Sound. He said, well, I don't build those. I said, well, I'd like to build it, and if I can use your workshop, and if you can supply me the materials, I'd like to do it with you. And he said, well, okay. And he got interested when I started building. And here's the wonderful thing. Uh, Steve Lassoff's Bidarka was the only survivor of the 1964 earthquake tsunami that destroyed Chiniga. And his Bidarka survived because it was in Cordova at the time, and it was in a museum. So I knew this, and I felt that to do a really good job of building these, that I had to go to Cordova and look at that, which I did, and I studied it in detail. So I built one at Corey's workshop. I've always felt Steve's spiritual influence, and when I was building that one up at Corey's workshop, I felt somehow as though I didn't even need to know how to build. It happened. I was, it was the strangest feeling. My hands were doing the work without even having to think about it. And I credit that to a couple things. One is I feel that Steve's spirit was guiding me. Uh, Steve passed away in 1969. Um, and the other was that watching the men work on these Bidarkas when I was six years old was an experience that stayed in my brain. I was imprinted, and so I actually knew how to do it. I learned how when I was six years old, but I wasn't trying to learn. I was just watching. And you know, that's how kids learn anyway. You learn language that way. And so it was a marvelous, magical, spiritual experience to build these. How close do you think the kayak building tradition came to being completely lost in Prince William Sound? Boy, it came close, really close. If it hadn't been for Steve's kayak in Cordova, I don't know if I'd have been able to bring it back. Well, there were some other museums that had kayaks too, so it, it would have been possible, but as far as I know, nobody was bu currently building them. The problem was that the builders that remained couldn't find people that would pick it up and carry it on. Actually, I had a wonderful experience last year. I, w I went to Chiniga Bay, which is the new village. It it's not on Chiniga Island, it's uh, on a neighboring island. So I went up in uh, the winter of 2012 and worked with the high school kids and the village people, and we built three of these in about eight weeks. There's something of a miracle in that, by the way. But it was wonderful, and the kids picked up on it quite a bit. And I have a suspicion that a couple of them will go on and build more. What did you use for skin? We're using nylon. And what are you using to waterproof that? I'm using the two-part urethane. By the way, I give all the credit for that to Corey Friedman. Corey developed that technique, and it's Oh, the finest technique I've ever seen. It's the best substitute for sea lion skin I've ever seen. It has the same flex, the same feel, the same look. It just works like seal skin. Uh -huh. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so do you think that pretty soon that there will be such a, a critical mass of people building these up in Alaska where they originated that that will become the new Mecca well, I would like to see that happen. I hope it happens. Uh, one consequence of the building project that we did up in Chiniga Bay is that they took them over to the old village in June and did a Bidarka blessing ceremony. And I think that may be the seeds for a new revival. By the way, I was talking about Steve Lassoff. One of the things he did was bless the Bidarkas when they were built. It involves sprinkling holy water on the Bidarka and singing and also doing a procession around the Bidarka. I don't know if Steve gave names to the Bidarkas. I do. I give a two-part name. I give a spirit name, 
and I give a paddle name. And the spirit name usually is of someone who was an elder and has passed away. And the paddle name is usually the one of the place where it was. I'm going up to Alaska in uh, just a week from now, and I'm going to be working at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage, and I'm going to be working at this New Czech Spirit Camp in Prince William Sound. The New Czech Spirit Camp is a spirit cultural camp run by Chugach Alaska Corporation, which is the corporation for the Prince William Sound people. They've run this camp for many years. I've been at that camp since 2003. This will be my 10th camp. And uh, again, I teach the kids there, but uh, the adults will be Andrew Abayo and Joe Tabios. And uh, they will be building independently. We will be building also an Anyak, which is the big open canoe. And uh, yes, it's been received very well. Andrew is a fine, independent kayak builder. He's built some of the Aleutian ones, and now he's starting to build the Aleutic, and I think he will carry it on. When I'm long gone, he'll be building. He's teaching his son as well, who's a little kid, six years old, like when I was a kid. <laughs> so I think those two are really going to go. Joe Tabio is also. He's also teaching his son to build. So they have received this very well, and I think that those men will carry this tradition on. Now, the high school kids I was talking about in Chinigo Bay, they take it for granted. You know, oh, yeah, it's nice we were able to do this, hell yeah. Well, maybe not, maybe not. I've been tracking them on Facebook. Maybe not. They tend to pretend that, ah, you know, it's just nothing. While well, they're building, they discover things about themselves that they didn't know they had. And I've seen this over and over when I'm working with the young people at the camp, that suddenly they find that their hands can do things that they didn't know they could do. And you can see their confidence grow, and you can see their self-realization grow. It's a come, becoming aware. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a connection between the man and the kayak that was very strong. There was a feeling that the kayak had its spirit and that you really had to pay attention to that and be in tune with the kayak and it would take care of you. But if you were not in tune with it, not with its spirit, that you were courting disaster. When you're in a kayak, you are connected to that environment. It's a, a loop of feedback and you're, you're part of it. So it's going back to your roots. It's reconnecting with the spirits.